Hello everyone and welcome to the very first episode of the Outpost podcast explainer video combination here with but yay drum yay. rolls uh thank you for that vision uh hello everyone uh it's fantastic to see you all and while right now the people i'm seeing are my wonderful co-hosts i'm hoping there are more people watching this when it finally comes out uh this is the outpost podcast uh hopefully your one stop shop to unravel and demystify everything ai and to see how best it affects you and how you can utilize ai rather than ai utilizing you uh with that we are going to do a quick round of introductions uh and like just a 10 second introduction for each of ourselves uh who we are our names and what we do uh dushant over to you hi folks super excited to be part of this podcast my name is dushant singh and i'm singh jareja it's a bit mouthful so you can call me dushant on jda both of them are fine uh i am an engineer turned product manager I have good fortune to uh, work with some of the uh, interesting companies like microsoft intel and google uh, in a recent part of my career i am passionate about exploring intersection of product management and scientific research and computation such as ai quantum computing crispr climate and so forth this podcast is a platform for us to share our is a, the podcast is a platform for us to connect with you where we can share our journeys and learnings uh in the world of uh, you know, artificial intelligence uh with that i'll introduce our other uh, podcast host soham mandal thank you dushant uh, thank you saranya super excited to be here uh, i'm soham um like dushant i've also done a lot of different roles in my past i've i've done uh, uh, development i've been a designer uh, product manager and so on i'm an entrepreneur as well so um you know i'm responsible for a lot of things um uh, i love to be at the intersection of design and technology and um, um i've been running my own uh, company for the last 12 years or so right so doing a lot of really interesting things and i love to be at the you know the application side of ai right that's something that really excites me and um super excited to be a part of this journey where we see how ai can apply to your lives right with that uh, over to saranya our most important host tonight uh my most important soha means the diversity quota um i am hi folks i'm saranya gopinath i am a lawyer uh, turned policy uh, policy practitioner turned product manager um i've had the immense privilege and pleasure of working with folks such as dushant and soham uh in building critical infrastructure in this country and being part of several dpi journeys as well um just like my co-hosts here uh, i do fully see the power of tech not only in empowering everybody but also in better informing ourselves uh and i'm super excited to start this empowering information journey uh, with all of you So yeah, let's get started. Woohoo! Great. So with this, uh, you know what we'll do is we'll probably go around the the table here and talk about some interesting topics on here, right? And uh, first, I think Dushant will get started on uh, one of the topics that's that he's really excited about. So Dushant, over to you. Sure. So today I'm going to talk about one of the uh, the people that has been kind of doing really, really. Uh, kind of you know, getting attention on the internet and that paper or that uh, breakthrough is called ai scientist correct uh, ai scientist was uh, published uh, a few weeks back by a small research lab in japan called sakana ai uh, the folks come from a again from a large research organization uh, and then they started this uh, research lab in japan what i like about this a uh, particular topic is that we have seen how ai has been kind of revolutionizing the industry a different different field out of it and you see uh, a lot of different innovations or results come out every day uh, this particular model has this much of parameter this particular uh, ai company has come up with 
uh, this application. But all of this thing is based on a one particular thing is that how strong is their research lab? How strong are sure. the people working in, in those organizations, correct? And hence this, the, this you can call that, that AI expertise is limited into those large organizations. But to me, uh, this paper kind of you know, completely uh, changes that equation. It, 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 the paper basically talks about how you can automate scientific research process right so that means so you can kind of use this model Sranya, you can use this model and can kind of you know create or give it a, a sort of an uh, a try to come up with a, another breakthrough uh, innovations in artificial intelligence so let me tell you more about it let me share my screen uh, so that you can uh, also kind of you know, follow along with me what I'm trying to say here, okay? Let me know if you can share my, if you can see my screen. A quick yes. Yes, uh, we can. Would be, okay. Wonderful. So this is the uh, a website. Uh, if you, let's say if I just go to sakana.ai, correct? It is just one landing page which talks about their blog and careers page. And if you go to the blog, uh, they have a bunch of announcement. And the paper that I'm going to talk about is this one, the AI scientist towards fully automated, open-ended scientific discovery. So pretty interesting, correct? So imagine uh, you are a technology company and, and you want to kind of uh, understand or kind of know, you understand AI a bit, but you also want to understand, okay, what are the next frontiers of this technology, correct? And to explore this, you really need uh, a people with that mindset, with that uh, expertise to be able to do that, correct? Building a product is one mindset where you think about problem space, solution space, how you kind of you know, go ahead and launch it, and some of those things. Research mindset on the other side is, is exploring completely different field altogether, correct? So it's a, that's why it's kind of you know, restricted to a particular community there. So in this, the Sakana AI team has kind of you know, created a framework of large language models, correct? So I want to kind of you know, jump into this particular thing. Yeah. So they've come up with a framework where they're using like, you know, multiple LLMs to be able to automate this scientific process. So let's say what happens in a traditional scientific process, correct? I worked at the research lab and uh, research scientists usually kind of start with understanding that, okay, how would I kind of, uh, you know, increase the uh, 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 translation capability of a, of a language? So let's say I have an English as a language and I want to translate English into one language or, or more than one language. Currently today, the way to kind of you know, do this translation is using a particular state of art method. But you really want to kind of you know, supercharge, you really want to kind of explore, are there better ways to do that? So you start with the problem space and then you try to understand, okay, integrated, I mean, the architecture of that particular uh, translation model and then try to say, okay, what are the things you can kind of you know, change around? Then you come up with a hypothesis. That hypothesis, then you have to come up with a, a plan to experiment with your hypothesis, document the result, and then kind of you know, share it. In this one, all of those things, they are doing the same process. They follow the same process, but it's been done by uh, large language models. So they have three language, three or four large language models. One LLM is mostly used for uh, idea generation, correct? So let's say you kind of you know, give them an, a topic and, and sort of kind of a template that the LLM takes it as an input and then interactively brainstorms ideas with you. So let's say a topic of, I was talking about translation is one topic, this okay, or you want to kind of you know, relook at translation approaches, what are the kind of you know, examples do you have in mind? So you could say, okay, I want to translate from one language to multi-language model, fantastic. How do you want to do it? Do you want to take it as a, uh, a block of text? Do you want to take it as a document? Do you want to take it as a, as a web page, so what are the different input methods you're trying to? So all of those brainstorming that happens 
with between uh, a person who wants to conduct research and an LLM out of it. It also, the LLM also kind of you know, semantically uh, searches the scholar and, and figures out what are the current uh, innovations happening in that particular topic. And then again, brings back those results to you that, hey, you want to do a research in this particular translation field. And then these are the current uh, innovations happening and things out of it. And then you can again pick one or maybe discard that particular direction and then kind of go about it. LLM can also give you a scoring uh, on those different research ideas that you have in terms of how novel is this idea, what is the feasibility of this idea, correct? And, and based on that, uh, you can kind of know, then uh, conclude, okay, yes, this is the a field of topic that I want to uh, I want to pursue out of it. So that's a one, uh, a, the first phase of this automating a scientific research process. Then it passes on to another LLM, uh, which basically takes that as an input and then designs an experiment uh, based on a particular template and also kind of you know, writes a code for that experiment out of it. Uh, it runs the code, it executes that particular experiment and, and gives you a result out of it. If the result is not according to what you're looking, it can kind of you know, update its plan and kind of you know, again go back and, 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 and re executes that experiment. Once the results are at kind of an expectation level that you have, it can also summarize the findings and also plots uh, the result and, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a nice visualization manner. It can tabularize uh, uh, different parameters on which a result is kind of you know, based or assessed. And then there is a third LLM that comes into picture, which basically takes these uh, findings and then writes uh, uh, a paper which can be uh, presented uh, in, a, in, a, in a machine learning conference out of it. Okay? And, and it uses uh, a predefined template to write this paper uh, and it kind of you know, gives you all of it. So it's a phenomenal kind of you know, uh, uh, discovery in my mind. Once you have the paper, then it also have a fourth LLM which is trained on, uh, on, on the papers or abstracts that have been submitted to many of these machine learning conferences. And uh, it kind of you know, reviews the paper and then gives you a score whether this is an acceptable uh, paper for this particular conference or not. So it's a phenomenal uh, kind of, you know, uh, uh, from my perspective, it's, it's, it's one of the, the very interesting breakthroughs that I have seen in recent times where it democratizes the artificial intelligence research. Uh, it kind of you know, provides uh, you know, smaller research labs, be it an academic or a corporate research labs, uh, and kind of you know, gives a shot in the arm to basically create or perform uh, really high quality research there. Uh, and, and they have kind of you know, explained this in, in beautiful places. So these are some of the example papers that they were able to generate out of uh, AI scientists. Uh, so here they are using dual skill diffusion, uh, where you know they are basically using adaptive feature balancing for low dimensional generative models. Uh, this is another one which is a style fusion, where you can use uh, multi style generation uh, in character level models out of it. And and some interesting, really really examples out there. Of course, this model doesn't is is not kind of uh, foolproof. It is it is, is the first iteration. Uh, of uh, of their approach and it has its own limitation out of it. So you know, one of those things you can assume very well that uh, sometimes kind of you know, LLMs have uh, this tendency to kind of you know, give you, so let's say in the first phase, which is an idea generation, it could have a tendency to give you a skewed results and it may not really kind of you know, give you a broad perspective. So again, you have to be mindful about how you kind of you know, set the direction and what you're looking for it. So I think you should start from abroad and then kind of you know, go narrow in that perspective, I would recommend here. The second thing is that sometimes the topic that you're giving it or the idea that you have given for LLM to perform a uh, research uh, discovery process, uh, the second LLM, which is an aider, may not be able to come up with required experiment or, or the code to basically kind of you know, validate that hypothesis out of it. The third one 
it could be possible that while writing the paper, the model hallucinates and, and kind of maybe goes off the bit. Uh, so it's it's good to kind of have uh, checks at each of those three or four stages uh, uh, and then try to see. But I think it's it's a fantastic first discovery from the from the lab, and uh, I'm super excited about uh, the promises it holds uh, for every one of us to kind of you know, understand and push the field of artificial intelligence. So, question from my side, uh, Dushant. This seems really interesting, right? Like, mm -hmm. um, how will humans, right, or teams, uh, uh, be part of this entire process? So, so think of this way, uh, you can, uh, or, or labs can use this to augment their research work. So I have to set up, I have to kind of you know, maybe uh, host this AI scientist in my infrastructure, in my environment. And then like how I interact with any application, be it a web-based or be it a kind of you know, hosted application, where I can, it's, it's think of this as like your hosted, LLM could be a chat GPT, could be a Gemini, but for your research work, correct? Uh, and this has an ability to kind of you know supercharge, like you know, it reduces the uh, uh, time to kind of you know perform research significantly out of it. Second thing, uh, in my perspective, the cost benefit advantage, you know, getting uh, like you know, first of all, doing a PhD is 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 both. And rightfully so, it's rigorous and time-consuming. Uh, but this one kind of you know, gives you sort of an, any a scientist, uh, any scientist could kind of you know, use this to kind of you know, come up with a really high-quality research out of it. So for me, I think the one thing I would say is that imagine uh, you have a power of uh, kind of you know, having a top-notch research scientist like uh, you know in your lab. So so to me, that's the biggest advantage. Very interesting because, you know, a lot of smaller companies cannot, don't have the time to do research or they don't have the entire pipeline. So, you know, there's so many different components which are interesting and together it's a really interesting proposition, but I see it like kind of democratizing research, right? Yeah. Correct. Really interesting. This is, this is fantastic. Um, and it's super interesting, but here's my question. When, and this is possibly for any point where we start using AI tools in our life and we engage AI in creating content, at what point does it get into cheating in your opinion? Because here's my point, as in, I think it's both ways, right? In academia, the bar is set often uh, intentionally, unattainably challenging or high. Uh, so do you think this is kind of, you know, using tech to challenge that or is it like, or does it not matter? Yeah, so, uh, you, so there are two, three ways to look at it, correct? One, it yeah. definitely, because, okay, let me kind of take a step back out of it. So what could happen when you use this particular discovery? Correct? So yeah. one potential thing is that, there are already a lot more research papers that I see on, on variety of journals. And yeah. one other thing is that it can kind of maybe multifolds the Trend. number of papers that are being kind of you know, submitted and hence sure. the overwhelming the review process itself. Yeah. Correct? Like a lot of people have to kind of you know, go through things out of it. So that's, yeah. that's definitely one such thing out of it. The second thing is that it may impact uh, it may impact the kind of you know, work that is very rudimentary or which is very kind of you know, very process driven in research right. thing it kind of you know, maybe uh, tend to kind of you know, maybe uh, efficiently kind of you know, do things out of it so imagine like you know, there's a lot of part of the research process which are very process oriented which are very sure. uh, and it can kind of you know, take away that trauma and the third thing is that it can also challenge like I would, if, if you're like really high top uh, high class researcher, you would want to work on the novelty towards it. You would want to kind of you know, be able right. to have that somebody who you can reason with it, correct? Um, so it, it implements uh, a chain of thought kind of you know, uh, mechanism where 
you could actually reason with uh, some of these LLMs and then try to kind of get things out. So yes, it has its challenges. As I said, this is it, I don't think it is it is uh, uh, it is foolproof yet. Also, there are ethical sure. consideration. Correct? Can this be used for uh, for malicious intentions, the research and, and things out of it? Correct? So mm. it can because technology has a two sides of it. Correct? It has yeah. a beneficial. It has a uh, a negative side as well. Can this be used to kind of you know explore things out of it? So all of those questions are valid and, and I yeah. think open in discussions out there. Uh, yeah. Uh, but I think uh, as I said, it is it is a first of its kind of you know, phase and stages. I really hope that uh, like you know people come together and explore this because one yeah. way to do is that you know you can you can you can push the limit of this is by trying and, and doing out of it i can see okay yeah. where does it break what are the things out of it so yeah. Yeah. did i answer your question i'm just trying to kind of uh, yeah no i think it's i think it's really interesting because just like i, I remember there was this uh, one article i mean i think this has happened in several other instances at this point where somebody submitted uh ai generated content for a photography competition or something of that sort right and yes. it won so then it's like, okay, now what do we do? So possibly we're going to maybe in the near future, you know, somebody submits a paper that is, that's used tools like this. Maybe there's a little bit of an asterisk next to it that, you know, this has been, you've utilized this tool to help create this that doesn't put you out of the running or in the running of one way or the other. It's just an additional factor to consider. Uh, as you absolutely rightly said, maybe not different from when one would use an asterisk, let's say, if you are uh, with Google research, because that implies a certain resource bandwidth, which somebody else doesn't have. So I think, you know, this is tangentially also helping highlight other parts of the conversation, which is what are the resources you need to pull off something like this? And then what happens when you start leveling the field? And then was it cheating before or was it, is it cheating now? And cheating is not the right word. But yeah, no, I think this is fantastic. And I, yeah, TLDR, I need to see it pushed to the limits and then see what happens. And one of the interesting conversations here, right, Saran, is uh, whether it's computer generated images or videos or whatever, right? How do you, how do you yeah. kind of know that it's computer generated, right? Like maybe a watermark yeah. or something. So yeah, ties into that whole debate, right, of how do you yeah. know that it's AI generated versus or AI assisted? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. super interesting. Sure. So yeah, conversation, and I think uh, at this point of time, as I said, this is like a very early phases of AI. Though, as much as we would like to believe that AI is kind of you now really taking over everything yeah. uh, in the industry, this is like a very very early nascent stages yeah. of AI. Where I would argue that they still need to prove like really strong. Uh, so these are all exciting. Uh, results, correct. Yep. But for it to become a norm, I think you know it. There are yeah. there are other things that we need to be happy. So I think one thing I would say, like right now, we no longer think twice before uh, using tools to do things like let's say if I want to write a paper, I there are already tools like LaTeX and and a bunch of others which allows me to write it in a nice format. Correct. Now. Why it is helpful because it kind of you know takes it absorbs the complexity of the process and helps me focus on the know-how or help me focus on this thing. So I think AI would probably do the same thing out of it, uh, where people will become more transparent about its usage, where the regulation will become mature to come up with the guidelines where you can use, where you cannot use out of it. Yeah. Uh, but again, I'm an eternal optimist, so I might have kind of. <laughs> Uh, kind of have a blind spot on some of those things there. Uh, but interesting perspective. Just to kind of yeah. give you a thing, there are also interesting research happening in that area where some of the things like watermark or some like, you know, the synth ID, again, yeah. uh, pretty interesting yeah. uh, research done by Google folks there, where you can assign a synthetic ID to a particular creation so that, you know, you could identify okay this is this is either done by ai itself or it is done in combination on collaboration with ai and human 
So yeah, exciting path ahead. Yeah, so thanks, Dushan. That was awesome. Awesome. So uh, okay, thank you, Dushan. Um, should we move on to Saranya for your interesting yes. topic? Moving from the eternal optimist to the career pessimist, <laughs> you have to tell you about everything that can go wrong on the planet. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, cool. Thanks, folks. And um, I want to talk to you today about uh, something that I guess everybody in the AI space has been talking about, and we'll also define everybody in just a bit. Uh, but it is the California AI Safety Bill. Um, as it stands today, as of day of recording, the bill has been passed by the legislature and is awaiting final confirmation by the governor, which is expected, the last date of which is September 30th. So uh, by September 30th, uh, Governor Newsom, who is a Democratic uh, candidate, or sorry, not candidate, govern, Democratic governor of California, will either confirm or reject the bill. And that's when it comes into law. Um, that when now when we say everybody has been talking about it, it's basically everybody in California, which uh, for all practical purposes is most of the large companies and all the big tech companies that are impacting or creating the AI space today. Um, when this bill came out, uh, there was you know a furore of activity and uh, lots of most of the usual suspects in the big tech space have actually come out very vocally against it and that includes all of the like google's open ai's of the world um and then on the other side there have been some groups and some individuals who have actually come out in support of the bill uh, like professor hinton uh, has come out in support of the bill uh, there have been uh, women's uh, rights advocacy groups that have come out in support of the bill and we'll get into like the what's and why's later interestingly anthropic uh, has come out with uh, with suggestions with uh, criticisms of the bill which were then later incorporated there were amendments and an amended version was released and then anthropic was like kind of midway territory and not taking either extreme now what is this damn bill and why should we care great questions okay so i'm going to quickly talk about some of like the major features of of the entire thing and what it's trying to do so as the name suggests uh, at least the the ai safety bill is of course not its official title the official title is um Senate Bill 1047, Safe and Secure Innovation for Frontier Artificial Intelligence Models Act. I Admittedly, that's why we call it the AI Very Safety Bill. Very easy to remember. Very easy to remember. Uh, so it's called the AI Safety Bill. Uh, now, what uh, it tries to address, so a couple of things, right? First, number one, who does it address? It addresses what they're calling as frontier AI systems. And what is a frontier AI system as per the bill? It is if it costs $100 million to train it slash is greater than uh, 10 to the power 26 flops a computing power. And second criteria is that, and this is part of what got amended, the cost of fine tuning the model is greater than $10 million, equal to or greater than $10 million. So uh, interestingly, one of the first pieces of legislation that have contemplated fine tuning as also a component to be considered, I was opposed to in just creating one. Right? So those are the two uh, entities that would be governed under this. Uh, now, what are the what does it seek to achieve? Number one, it puts in a bunch of uh, safety and security protocols. So it talks about how there are certain protocols to be implemented. There are certain audits that the system needs to put itself through at an annual basis. They even talk about who will set out the governing systems of audit. Uh, and then they talk about, uh, you know, the kind of safety protections they have to have in place. Uh, now, one of the kind of evaluations of this is that most large organizations that already have this in place, that this is an additional uh, piece of burden that you're going to be uh, kicking in, which is not, may not be the industry norms, very subjective in nature. But let's say as a baseline implementing certain safety and security protocol, there is a certain sense of appreciation of that aspect across the board. Uh, but another piece which it does kick in is that it suggests that there should be a kill switch for systems if there is 
perceived to be critical harm. Now, this is the fun bit uh, where I really want to share the definition of critical harm. And then I want to have a long conversation with you folks about it. Uh, but one second, here we go. Yeah. Okay, can you see my screen? I know this looks like gobbledygook, yes. uh, but I will just highlight what it is that we want to cover. Uh, so critical harm, oh, this is what it does not include. Yeah, there. Critical harm means any of the following harms that can be caused or materially enabled by a covered model. Covered model is models that are created by any of the frontier AI systems. Number one, creation or use of a chemical, biological, radiological, or nuclear weapon in a manner that causes mass casualties. Number two, casualties resulting in $500 million of damage resulting from cyber attacks on critical infrastructure or precise instructions for conducting cyber attack. C, casualties or at least $500 million of damage resulting from an AI model engaging in conduct that does both of the following, acts with limited human oversight, results in death, great bodily injury, property damage, property loss, and constitute a crime. Okay? Just take a second, process that. Because this is very close to like Lex Luthor territory, at which point my argument is the ship has sailed, send the people to jail, and carry on. Uh, but that's part of what is being contemplated as uh, where, the point where a kill switch needs to be incorporated, or at least have the ability to uh, kind of shut it down with a simple view. Uh, I will get back to this in just a minute, but I'm going to take a pause with that. Uh, another major feature that the AI safety bill does talk about, and understandably, this is one of the more contentious ones, it puts on substantial individual liability or like liability on developers and says that developers are liable for if their models have this impact. Now, one of the unintentional downstream impacts of this, which is where a lot of folks have come up, up in arms, is that this will impact open source. This will impact foundational models, arguably, because the argument is that even when it starts impacting people who are fine tuning models or having second order effects and adopt it and then start working on it, if there is a critical harm caused by somebody else who has used your open source model, potentially you could be liable as well, which obviously tries to, I mean, uh, in fact, potentially takes a lot of the AI advancements in the opposite direction. Uh, it disincentivizes any large tech organization from open sourcing AI, which has really led to the revolution that we're currently enjoying. So that is a major issue. Uh, and then the last major uh, item is that it provides a bunch of whistleblower protections. Uh, there has been criticism that the whistleblower protections it provides can potentially be abused. And so some of that is also not fun. It's kind of like overtly encouraging whistleblowers. Um, so that's where they've been a little upset about it, but that's one of the fields. Uh, I will take a pause here. There is a lot to unpack. But I will take a pause if there are any questions, queries, then we'll jump right in. Just one comment. I think developers will take the front of all of this. Who are developers? <laughs> This is the point. So it doesn't even talk about, like, it doesn't clearly identify organizations or things like that. It talks about developers. And yeah. we need to kind of unpack a little bit about what does it mean, developer organizations? Like, obviously, individuals cannot be held liable. It has to be a Google or something. And I'm sure IP law will take care of that. But yeah, it doesn't, it kind of kills the spirit of how, like, an open AI or, like, just all model development work and everything has been happening right now. So that's but one day you're just, you are, sorry. You are assuming that the developers have, the, the developer or the research scientist has built that model. It could also be the case, maybe AI has a built a model. So uh, uh, this is where, uh, this, yeah. we're definitely going to get into mad cow disease territory, right? Where it's like, who has created the model? What level of it is actually created by a developer? Um, how much of it is organic, who needs to be held responsible and how can you even, so I have to say, so one of the amendments that they have incorporated was that they have narrowed pre-harm enforcement because earlier they had, they have narrowed it, not eliminated it. Earlier there was a larger purview of, uh, 
free harm enforcement that could be anticipated. And that's like minority reports, right? Where we're saying that this potentially could mess up and then we have a bunch of liability. Uh, but that has been narrowed, but not completely eliminated. So that's also going to be something to kind of watch out for amongst other things. So one day you're just like coding and fixing bugs and the next day you're like, uh, you yeah. know, accused of making like a, a weapon of mass destruction or something, right? Because <laughs> I used your model for the creation or use of a chemical, biological, radiological or nuclear weapon. That is insane. Um, yeah, so poor developers. Yeah, totally. T- <laughs> so so home is just like, leave my people oh, alone. Yeah. So, so super interesting, correct? I think it does look like a more of a conservative side kind of an argument to safeguard the uh, the kind of yeah. impact of a model could have. I think uh, so. So that's kind of a pretty evident from the yeah. from the bill itself. Uh, but that's also how a usual uh, technology or even any breakthroughs. Like, you know, there's a lot of resistance towards that adoption. Like yeah. a, and that's a, we have seen in the past as well. Uh, so yes. I'm not surprised in terms of like, you know, the kind of uh, safeguards that a particular bill employs out of it. Uh, but it would be interesting to kind of you know, see how some of this can be enforced. Correct. So yes. that's, that's another uh, way of one is having those kind of, you know, safeguard mechanism the second is that how do you monitor that how do you implement that in a in a, in a, in a yeah. things out of it and the yeah. third one is that once you detect that what are the things you kind of want to do that i mean correct we have seen similar things with data privacy laws and some of the other things out of it. yes uh, while it does have i mean you you might have seen some organization might have uh, kind of you know, got caught into that particular framework. Maybe there were penalties, there were kind of a bunch of other repercussions out of it. But I have never seen uh, a developer or maybe a small organization yeah. getting into that, uh, that yeah. things out of it. Uh, yeah. So it would be interesting. So again, uh, so I'm, I'm kind of you know, on the fence with the bill, honestly. It's it's both encouraging on some point of view. Yeah. It's also kind of you know, discouraging uh, kind of you know, on innovation. On So I, I'm kind of... You know, I'm with you, so on, on both things out there. Uh, yeah. But as like anything, let's wait to see how kind of you know, this gets rolled out. The what second thing happened? is that it would be also interesting to see how policymakers keep monitoring this. Yeah. Correct. Like, it's is it just a ink on the paper or there's a next iteration coming in? There's like yeah. future things. Yeah. And it's no. impact on the global. Uh, yes. Things. Sorry, sorry. Yes. Go ahead. You were saying something. No, no, no. One, one hundred percent with you on each of that, right? And I'm going to, I'm going to do something. I'm going to play like turncoat on this because a lot of the people who've had, like, who've been very vocal about this, understandably, have been like the big techs who are already in this and investors and basically, obviously, with people with a lot of skin in the game. Uh, I'm going to take the advantage of being nowhere close to California uh, to kind of give my to kind of both sides of the argument, right? So I think one thing is absolutely to your point, Dushant. I think in terms of a new technology, trying to, uh, you know, figure it out, if nothing else, kind of just saying, can we just start talking about this in a way that starts making sense to us? And that's where, let's say, uh, some of the arguments for the people supporting the bill came from, um, which is that for better or for worse, there is this kind of awe inspiring fear or perception of AI today, right? Where there is a thing of, oh, this could go way beyond our understanding. And so some of the women's rights groups who were in support of the bill, their entire perception is this is going to, let's say with deep fakes and things like that, there is going to be a disproportionate impact on minority groups and vulnerable groups such as women. And so we are in support of this bill, which is completely fair. Um, But on the other hand, apart from, let's say, critical harm, the bill does not really get into detailing other kinds of harm and really what are you looking to prevent. Uh, To my mind, on the spectrum of what harm is, what they've laid out as critical harm, it's like comically insane. This is like 
Pinky and the Brain has conceptualized this. Um, in fact, I think that somebody had this has triggered from some urban legend where somebody had actually tried getting ChatGPT or something to generate a radiological uh, chemical or radiological weapon, and it was just it like just added like strong existing identified radiological material as an ingredient and everything and said yeah this is going to be, yes it's going to be harmful so i think understanding where to my mind this bill has completely missed the point uh, amongst others is that it seems to not know what it's trying to protect people from this definition of critical harm is is an extreme if we have reached that point then i assure you a crim uh, like a slap on the hand from the act or from the government is the least of your problems the the genie is out of the bottle i appreciating and understanding the more rudimentary impacts of actual ai harm such as when ai is invoked into decision making when ai generated content is indistinguishable from other content none of that is really identifiable because that is really the everyday stuff which people are going to be impacted by this seems to be targeted towards in their minds only large tech organizations which also the monetary thresholds are laughably minimal um and they seem to be targeted at like these very extreme perspectives but not talking about like the more normal ways in which we are possibly going to be harmed by ai before we get to that uh and in all of that saying you're going to pin liability on an unsuspecting developer who did not have the intent of creating such a model is is like just finding you know a scapegoat and being like okay you're it um so yeah in my summary is as follows the people while there are several folks who are on the same page as to the intent of what the bill is trying to do um the supporters are glad to see some action the defectors or the people against it the detractors are along the lines of yes liability is is definitely misplaced this is not uh, and also one very clear point that the critics have laid out is that harm, what harms of ai are not very different from let's say harms that exist today ai will possibly scale it up but not really create a new harm and that's some of the critics have. uh my opinion being far away from all of this uh is that it's actually not doing enough is that if you really want an ai safety bill this seems performative um and it's very you know targeted at like money bags without really doing anything uh which brings me to actually the last point that i want to cover on this uh sitting in india should we care right is this of relevance to us is it of importance to us uh and the answer is kind of twofold uh one the bill is not very clear with regards to its applicability so for example some interpretation see it as like a gdpr situation wherein if the if it impacts californian citizens you could be the the law could be invoked in which case if you are building a model that is deployed in california or impacts californian citizens you sh- you may have to care about this um but then I think the second point is what Dushan said, which is, what could this mean for everybody else who's trying to create AI legislation? What do they take from this, and how do they incorporate it? Um, I think it's just a very, very interesting case study to see how people are reacting to it, what the concerns, what are the problem statements, um, and how it definitely impacts innovation and the next set of people who are going to be creating it. So, yeah. that was that's my kick of the day of looking at this crazy bill uh, yeah i'll take a pause here from sarania so one more thing right like if you're yeah. talking about models right like there are mm. so many other things like social media or search engines right like yeah all the things that you talked about could be done by those as well right you could get yes. information from social media or yeah. through a search right and yeah. that's probably happening right like what does it mean for exactly. things that are not covered right it's not a model but something yeah. that you find on somewhere right what does it mean no no actually you're spot on so to be fair it does call out that 
the critical harm definition does not include where the derivative outputs of the information is otherwise publicly accessible today. Um, or it did, you know, the model did not materially contribute to the software's ability to cause or enable the harm. So, and then not caused by the, so 100%, you are absolutely right that if it is something that's already done today, should this cover it? Uh, and the answer is no, it does not. Like that's not impacted. Now, is that a good thing or a bad thing or just a logical loophole in this entire thing? I don't know. Uh, because obviously, absolutely to your point, that exposes the intention of the bill, right? You're looking for somebody to blame. You're not looking to address the actual harm. You're not saying that this is a problem and we will figure out that this problem is to be put back in the bottle. You're saying this seems to be offending material. If you saw it, otherwise it's cool. But if it's seen through an AI system, then do something about it, which you kind of need to figure out what they're trying to do and what they're trying to address. Um, so yeah, I am, uh, but I, I get where people are up in arms and I definitely get why it's generated so much conversation. Um, but I think it's going to fall logically on its face very soon. Um, yeah, so, so, so just to kind of you know, say, correct, what it is hoping that when people are building models or building applications, they want to look at broader intent of that. Yeah. And kind of you know, maybe assume, okay, this could potentially could go wrong and have a safeguard into it. However, yeah. as, as Saranya mentioned that the AI safety bill is not intelligent. It's artificial. It's not intelligent enough <laughs> <laughs> because uh, no one knows about like you know what could kind of you know could go wrong out of it. I think that's where the large companies yeah. are also a bit of uncomfortable. That okay, yeah. I'm training a foundation model on vast yeah. generalized heterogeneous data. So let's say, and then the specific task is being done by the end uh, correct user out of it now there could be thousand of those use cases correct and yeah. then one use case you can't be holding accountable for things out of it so exactly in fact yeah. when i was uh, listening to this podcast which was talking about you know like and and uh it's the the, the rt and shriram show they had an episode on this and we were, they were discussing the very same point where especially with regards to the threshold the threshold seems to cover let's say you know, large language models or systems like that, which are covering this impressive computing power threshold of 10 to raised power 26. But the argument is also being made is that actually the large language models have possibly, uh, like I think the phrase you used was it's smoothed out. It has a, it's averaged out to a large extent. It is not trying to specifically solve a problem. So the first assumption we're making is that the large language model can have a larger dangerous impact than a smaller model, which is built to specifically reach a particular objective. So let's say if you have built a, spe a smaller model, but with a very specific intent to create a certain kind of harm, uh, that could potentially go under the radar. And it's the large language model, which does not have the capacity to, ha to create such a sharp harm, which will come under this act. The first assumption they're making is that the large, more generalized content is more harmful or can potentially cause more harm than anything else. And I think that assumption itself, they were the argument was, is is false. Yeah. So I think in, in the context window, so the bigger the context window, correct? Yes. You know, you're trying to kind of know more generalize out of it. Uh, and because the larger context window, the all the other thing you mentioned, the... 10 to the power 26 flops and like, you know, yeah. the, the amount of infrastructure required to train is, is, is that's where they're safeguarding it. But yeah. on the other side, if you look at the more specific model, which is trained for a specific task, so you need to have that data for to kind of to be able to do that. Uh, but it lacks that, uh, that kind of, you know, riding on giant shoulder kind of it, let's say like, you right. know, things out of it. So, uh, it kind of, in there, principally, it, it kind of becomes uh, still challenging to get to a model with that accuracy on a, on a small thing. But again, as I said, these are all, this is artificially not intelligent. 
<laughs> yeah, uh, kind of no way of looking into it, but super nice then, and I'm very happy that you you dig into it. You kind of have to put the things out very. It, it kind of to makes no, me no. go back and read more about it, and also kind of to watch R K and Sri Ram's show to kind of to learn yes. more about it. Thank you, thank you. For no, sharing. it was. Yeah, and, no, no, it was really interesting. I'd love to kind of um, maybe we'll add a link uh, to the podcast as well for people to check it out. And I, I love Serena how you go through the things that we. probably just always scroll and accept or something like you're actually going through all these you know details and understanding the context which is something i've this learned to right. appreciate you plus one, plus one, one, one I have, person I have is excited question. about reading it sorry plus one to what so i'm saying i have a trivia question now oh no how many end user license agreement do you read <laughs> you know what nobody does even like i would none of the lawyers read that it's because it's intended to obfuscate um so yeah 100% but bills are more exciting uh, <laughs> do check it out so you so you go through each and every which is fantastic thank you yeah no no thank you cool now with that over to soham take it home cool thanks sarena dishant um i'll probably you know talk a little bit about uh, something which is lighter uh, on a lighter note let me share my screen so i love to uh, you know play games right that's something i love doing so i'll just talk about uh, something uh, which is about games and large language models and diffusion and everything together right so this is something i was reading about a couple of weeks back um, essentially it's a paper as well as um, an interactive demo that you can actually try out right so i, I love applied ai so uh there's also a paper that you can go and read about this which is something i would definitely recommend that everybody uh does over here right so the paper is right here it's uh from folks at google research tel aviv uh, university deep mind and so on the usual folks and um the original paper was actually a couple of years old and this is the latest version uh, they've kind of uh, found, found a lot of interesting output right so this is from august but the uh, the original paper is also worth a read right because it it goes into some of the details but what are we talking about right we are talking about how they used different models and different uh, engines to create a game which is fully created on the fly right um so till now what happens right if you're playing a game right or reading a book right essentially what happens is somebody has thought about the game or the book right they've thought about the script the actors um and essentially then created it right you're you're living somebody else's perspective or dreams or or reality in some ways right or a team's collaboration right um so what these guys have done is they have created um a game which is created on the fly right um so If you're not aware, right? Doom is a game that was released in the 1990s. It was one of the first games that was launched. Um, I wouldn't call it a 3D game. It's actually what they call a 2.5D game. So it's it looks 3D, but it's not, right? It's it has all these sprites and stuff. But essentially, it's a very simple uh, structure, right? So you're not really creating 3D objects, right? Like models and so on, but you're creating 2D sprites. So that's something which is easy to do today, right? Have all these different models, like stable diffusion, right? It's an open source model which you can use to create sprites, right? Um, and Doom is a fairly popular game, and people have played it and created a lot of mods on it. But what they have done is uh, they have they have kind of created this whole architecture, right? I'll just kind of explain what's happening over here, right? You can actually load up the game, right? And it creates the entire game for you on the fly, right? So it's unscripted, right? um what's happening over here so they have got this uh, reinforcement learning engine right i'll not go into the details here but um essentially uh, the machine has actually played doom a lot right so open source game now it's played doom over and over again so it knows how uh, things work right the mechanics right what is uh, what is the concept of a health right what is armor right how much ammo do you have what are the kind of weapons uh, that that are there in the game what are the entire uh, simulated environments right? there are indoor environments there are external environments so the game is actually played um, the model has actually played the game a lot and understood about what's going on 
right? What are the different components of the game? And what does it mean for a player to play the game? And if I'm going through, there's a monster, I hit it, my health goes down, right? Or I lose ammo. It's understood that, right? So there's this is very interesting um, um, reinforcement learning model, which does that, right? Once it does that, it passes on its learnings to a generative uh, image model, very similar to stable diffusion, right? It's actually stable diffusion. And it creates 20 frames um, per second of whatever the, you know, the reinforcement learning uh, model is actually telling it, right? So essentially, if you're in a certain place, right, um, and you're moving around, right, uh, based on what has happened in the last couple of seconds, it actually creates the next frames for you, 20 uh, frames a second, it just creates and kind of simulates that for you, right? So if you're moving in front, right, um, it kind of determines what your future will be, where you will go, and then creates the entire simulation, the entire environment for you, um, and figures out what the image will look like, right? And then feeds it back into the, the model and, and creates the next few frames, right? So what, what happens over here essentially is it creates the entire game on the fly for you, right? Um, why is this kind of interesting? Because this means that, you know, you can have all these different environments that you don't have to create from scratch. You can train um, models on different environments. It could be cities, it could be uh, other games or uh, even books, right? And based on generative AI, you could fill in the gaps or let's say you're, you want to create a, a, a comic, right? You give it some idea of what the comic should be. And then as you read it and you as you get more uh, engrossed in certain sections, it could kind of create that book forever for you. You could have a book that you can have, you know, reading and reading and based on what you've liked, it will create plot twists and uh, will fill in the gaps in such a way that you'll, you'll kind of read the book forever, right? I don't know if that makes sense, right? Um, which is the super interesting bit, right? It, it uses already existing technology like reinforcement learning, stable diffusion to create this never ending loop of sorts, which is uh, super interesting. Of course, this model is not perfect. There's a lot of hallucination. And so after you play the game for about a minute or so, right, um, it kind of starts to hallucinate, right? So um, um, it it takes you places that probably are not correct, right? Um, uh, so for example, if you walk into a door, right, uh, it creates this room for you, right? But if you walk out of the door right then, right, you just go back, it takes you back to the right place. But if mm. you've been in that room for, let's say, a minute, you've done a lot of activities, you go back, the original room might not be completely as per your uh, expectation. There might be new things which are there, right? Uh, but the surprising thing is, you know, your health, ammo, all the, the core aspects, the mechanics of the game, right, which are the, the most important things, are actually functional, right? So the game state is preserved, right, and uh, fairly accurate, right, which is incredible. Uh, but yeah, it does hallucinate like most uh, generative models, right? Super interesting, a lot of uh, implications for the future, right? Does it mean um, there won't be game developers? I don't think so. Or there won't be storytellers. I think that will be obvious there. But probably, right, it's more easier than ever to create levels of stories or plot twists, um, to create interesting encounters, right? And uh, there's so many other applications, right, in different fields, wherever you're writing content, right, uh, the way that you could train um, AI to create content without you necessarily telling it everything or creating the assets is, is incredible, right? So again, uh, definitely check it out. This entire thing is called Game Engine. Uh, the paper is titled uh, Diffusion Models are Real-Time Game Engines, which is incredible, but... Uh, the concept itself is called Game Engine. It's open sourced, right? If you want to run this, of course, you need a, a fairly beefed up PC. You need TPUs and stuff, uh, which is difficult to run locally, right? Uh, but definitely the code is open source. You can definitely check it out. At some point, this will be able to run on your system as well, right? Uh, yeah. Saranay any I have thoughts? I have two questions, Soham. Yes, sir. Two very pressing questions. Number yes. one. Have you tried this already? Number two, has it been pr on Prince of Persia? Because that's the only thing I want to see in reality, right? So you watched the second question, uh, Serenia? Have you done, have you done, have you made it on Prince of Persia? 
because I want to see Prince of Persia. Oh, absolutely. So this is actually tougher than Prince, right? Uh, I haven't played this because it requires a beefy hardware, right? It's it's running yeah. uh, reinforcement learning plus uh, staple diffusion. It generates twenty frames in real time, then plays it back before you know, right? As you're pressing the button in that. Uh, That's amazing, right? In that entire time, the entire thing is getting processed and fed back to you, right? So it it yeah. requires a lot of processing power right now. I'm thinking Prince of Persia would be easier because it's a 2D environment. You're just going from left to right. Oh, you're right, actually. So yeah. it should be or easier to do. Or maybe this is the time to make a 3D version of Prince of Persia because really, that's the true sorrow of our childhood that we never got to a proper 3D version. There of are 3D versions, I mean. What? You haven't How played. old am I? Are you serious? Yeah, yeah lots, Stop. lots. No. Listen, I, think, I stopped playing it like in the eighth grade, and then after that, whatever development has happened, I've ignored it. Yeah, so so I'm I'm sure, right? This will happen to platformers and other things. So much innovation yeah. happening in AI, right? Like maybe you can speak to a you know person who's selling you stuff in a game and then have a conversation about something, right? So so many yeah. interesting things. Like that. This is amazing. This is super interesting. Thanks for sharing it so much. I think it kind of you know brings back. Uh, So I'm a very casual gamer, correct? Like I'm not a like a hardcore gamer, but my son kind of you know he plays a like you know lot of games out of it, and often I kind of you know we associate playing game a PC game at the time was kind of you know, a way of challenging. I think those games are challenge. So you kids would like to be challenged because they prove okay I can do things out of it. So I think it's, there's an element of learning as well, and for me the while gameplay is one very very interesting aspect of it game designing is another completely field out of it and this kind of gives you that ability so imagine you be able to create like you know a flappy bird or maybe you be able to create like you know even simple games like tic tac toe and be able to understand the logic how things are worked for me it's a phenomenal uh, way to kind of you know understand how games are built and designed out of it second thing it also kind of you know takes that complexity away from you of knowing the know how of computer graphics and some of the things and focus on the logic and, and things out of it so there is a another super interesting uh, because many times what happens is that people might have a logic or idea about what gameplay should look like but they don't have other skills to be able to kind of you know try and build things out of it So I think that's a super super interesting in, in, in my perspective. You're absolutely right, Dishan. In fact, you know, uh, if you read the uh, the details of the researchers here, right, none of them are game developers. It's very oh, wow. interesting, right? So the model is just just like you know, uh, like Go and all these other things, right? DeepMind actually figured out, right? The computer figured out, the model figured out how to play it. So the entire mechanics, the uh, so it's a very organic pipeline from understanding what is happening. So it's reading right it the reinforcement model actually sees how the the graphics are getting created from that it takes to recreation right so it doesn't know about how the code was kind of uh, the mechanics were cre- was created right so you're absolutely correct right so um it's just that that pipeline of learning and creation is is super simple right yeah. yeah super nice super. and i'm pretty hopeful i think while i do understand and it's not just specific to a diffusion architecture or anything i think we have seen a bit of hallucination in many different architecture which is out there but i think i think the one thing what i would like to highlight here is that and i kind of maybe over emphasize again and again is that well ai is still in very early nation stages out of it correct the more it becomes mature many of the things like you mentioned and ability to kind of you know remember Or maybe how you craft a prompt, or how do you basically give a command out of it? Maybe it could remember, uh, like you know, which room I was previously, and then try to kind of you know go back and things out of it. So that's a one way to look at it. Or maybe dynamic games, correct? Like imagine yeah. the you are into a game like how life is not scripted, correct? Yeah. Like the game is also not scripted, and you kind of you know jump into that and, and try to figure things out. So yeah, I mean, super nice. Thank you for sharing it. Very exciting. Yeah, this is very cool. Thanks, Arunya. Thanks, Ushant. Lovely. Cool. So we're at the end of our um, first episode of the podcast today. How are you all feeling, Arunya, Ushant? I think this was super fun. <laughs> yeah, I love the conversations I... and 
Yeah. Yeah. I I feel like you know what I feel. Um. So whenever so in school, um, chemistry was not my strong suit. I do not understand what was happening a lot of the time. Organic chemistry sucked at it. Uh, and then there was this friend of mine who was like the class dropper and everything, also, but also a very good friend of mine. So I would pretend I'm going to her, you know, her place to like group study or something of that sort. We would talk about the most random things under the pretext of group study. But somehow at the end of the day, I would still come out, you know, a little smarter, having learned a little bit more at the end of the day, even though we didn't really pretend to study at all. Uh, that's what this feels like. It feels like I've hacked studying. It feels like I spent an hour hanging out with my friends and uh, I've learned a lot at the end of it. So this was super fun. Yeah, same. same. Likewise. Yeah. The, the only difference is that like in this conversation, I think you are the expert and we are kind of not feeling it. <laughs> yes, I mean, you're the expert. No, no, no. No, no. <laughs> organic chemistry level of expertise is different, folks. That is not the analogy. We do not make, we do not get organic chemistry to this. No, but this was plus one to, I think, this was super fun. I think, uh, echo to Serenia's point here like you know definitely feel like i'm leaving this discussion with a lot of learnings and a lot of work to read upon <laughs> and, and, and things out of it so hopefully collectively this will improve and increase our understanding of the field and yeah, yeah. nice awesome. so if you like this please like the video or subscribe whatever and uh, looking forward to you know talking to all of you very soon thank you Thank you. Likewise. Thank you. See you all. Share, subscribe, like, and see you <laughs> next episode.